Hi everybody, thanks for coming today. My name is Paul Jungworth and I'll be speaking about my progress adding some temporal features to Postgres. I have two patches that um, are uh, being worked on right now. Neither is quite finished. Multi-ranges is pretty close, I hope. Uh, they're both you know, in the commit fest app. Uh, so I wanted to talk about what these patches do, but mostly about the approach that I've taken to implement them. Um, I'm happy for feedback on either of these things. And uh, by the way, I want to thank all the people who've contributed time reviewing these patches, offering feedback on the mailing list, uh, even just giving me uh, motivation to uh, focus on them. Uh, so I, I'm very appreciative of all of the, the contributions that people have made to that. I gave a talk here at PGCon last year about how temporal databases work and the SQL 2011 standard. And this, uh, this talk this year is, um, will hopefully show my, the progress that I've made since then uh, in actually implementing some of these features. Uh, because of the audience here, I want to especially focus on uh, the hard parts and uh, of the implementation size side where someone else might have a better idea. So this talk is really intended for Postgres hackers, uh, although others might find it interesting also. I'm kind of a dilettante Postgres hacker myself. My full job is more like writing Ruby and Python and JavaScript, maybe Java or um, something a little bit lower level. Uh, my Postgres work is pretty much all in my evenings, uh, but I've done C you know, since high school, and I love getting to work on something a bit more challenging than web apps. I found Postgres to be a wonderful community to be a part of. I do work on Postgres a lot, both as an application developer and doing more DBA, sysadmin, DevOps kind of things. I've written a bunch of extensions over the years, including a proof of concept extension for temporal, primary, and foreign keys. Uh, working on these patches has taught me a lot, and so uh, hopefully along the way I can share some tidbits that might help other nighttime Postgres hackers. There are lots of other talks and articles out there introducing Postgres hacking. Um, I think there's room for another one, so maybe I'll give that as a real talk someday. I hope so. Uh, but even this one, this talk might have a little bit of tidbits. So the first thing I've been working on is multi-ranges. The multi-range is a new type. It's a lot like our existing range type, but just a little bit different. Here in green, you can see a range. It has upper and lower bounds. And in yellow, you can see a multi-range. So it's a sequence of non-touching ranges. Unlike a range, you can have gaps in it. Here are some ranges and multi-ranges as strings. Uh, first a couple of ranges, and then a couple of multi-ranges. You can see that an empty range uses the uh, string empty, and a multi-range uses these uh, empty curly brackets. Multi-ranges are automatically canonicalized for you. So here's some examples that are not multi-ranges. You can't have a multi-range that contains the empty range. Uh, well, they all contain empty ranges, we'll see, but you can't have it like this. And you can't have ones with uh, distinct, have ranges that would touch or overlap that wouldn't just be a single range inside the multi-range. One thing multi-ranges add is mathematical closure. I don't mean a function that closes over its variables. Uh, I mean the math concept of closure, where if you have a domain of values and an operator, then the operator always gives a result from that same domain, no matter what inputs you use. So if you take the positive numbers, addition is closed, because adding addition of any two positive numbers gives you a positive number, but not subtraction, because you could wind up with a negative number. Ranges are not closed for union or difference, which we write here as plus and minus, because both of those operators can give gaps. And if you do this today in Postgres, you get an error. With multi-ranges, you don't get an error, right? You just get another multi-range, and if it has a gap, that's fine. So it's kind of nice to have this property in, you know, in anything that you're working with. Every built-in range type comes with a multi-range type now. Uh, strictly speaking, ranges and multi-ranges are not types, 
but they're types of types, right? The, the real concrete types are IT4 range, TS range, etc. And likewise, you have IN4 multi range, TS multi range. Also, creating a new custom type automatically creates a new custom range type, a custom multi range type. So if you created a text range, you would get a text multi range for free along with it. Just like you would also get a uh, text range array along with it without having to do anything extra. And finally, uh, just as there are a couple range related polymorphic types, now there are a couple of multi range polymorphic types. Here's what a multi range looks like in memory uh, they are var lemma uh, values, so they don't have a consistent length. Uh, we have the OAD, the OID of the concrete multi-range type, so that we know, you know, is this an int4 multi-range or a date multi-range or what? And then we have a count of all of the the ranges that are inside of the multi-range. Because range types are also var lemma, we can't include them as a field in the struct here. In fact, even inside of a range, the upper and lower bounds are var lemma. So we have var lemma inside of var lemma inside of var lemma. Uh, Ranges have a very similar looking struct that only has the, the range type OID and then the the bounds, well, end flags, and the bounds are stuck at the end and you have to do some manual pointer arithmetic to access them. So what this means is that when iterating over the ranges, you have to advance this pointer by hand. There's a multi-range deserialized function that does this for you and gives you back a, a range type star star so that you, uh, we can encapsulate these details. Uh, by the way, a lot of the code I'll show in these slides has comments omitted and white space changed and uh, you know is a little bit simplified, maybe less error handling. So don't be alarmed if any of this uh, looks not quite right for, uh, you know, for Postgres standards. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about here is I got a request on the mailing list uh, recently to store less than the full range type in each of the entries here. And that's because the range type struct includes the OID of the specific concrete range type, just like we do. But uh, you don't really need that for multi-range because the multi-range type OID tells you the range type OID. And it's a little bit wasteful if you're going to have a multi-range with 10 range types in it to have the range type OID and the range type OID and the range type OID 10 times. Uh, and so it may be desirable to take that out. Uh, hopefully this would only be for the on-disk format. I don't actually know how to have an on-disk format that is different from the in-memory format. Maybe someone can help me understand how to do that. Uh, even if we had to have them the same, since most access goes through the multi-range deserialized function, I guess I could uh, build up range types uh, real range type structs on the fly for the callers of that. I'm a little skeptical that this would really be a performance win compared to uh, inefficiency of repeating the range type OID. So I'd appreciate any uh, judgments from more experienced hackers about what is really uh, worth doing here. Okay, here's a little bit of code from the multi-range deserialized function and you see that it does the pointer hopping to give you a list of range structs. There's alignment issues because ranges have to be aligned and their upper and lower bounds have to be aligned. So it's nice that you don't have to do this you know, all over the place whenever you're operating on multi-ranges. The multi-range operators are pretty much the same as range operators. In fact, many of these will now accept uh, mixed ranges and multi-ranges. You know, one one on the left and one on the right. The idea is to make it easy to move between the two different uh, two different type families. There's nothing too interesting about implementing these. I tried to delegate to range functions whenever possible, so you know, defining the behavior of these in terms of range behavior. There are lots of mathy properties of ranges that multi ranges preserve. Ranges and multi-ranges have a nice additive property where the empty value is an additive identity. So if you add empty, you get back what you started with. So if you subtract empty, you get back what you started with. Uh, 
with the multipli multiplicative properties, you know, in this case, uh, intersection for ranges and multi ranges, the it's not a, quite as clean. We can, you know, what what would you say is the multiplicative identity? You could say that it's the range from null to null, so the range from everything to everything, so that when you intersect with that, you get back what you started with. Um, that's okay, uh, but if you do that, do it that way, then you can't really come up with uh, a multiplicative inverse. But at least you can say that like x x times zero equals zero. You know, if you're using zero as a different way of spelling it, you. in addition, x includes y is the same as saying that uh, y adds nothing new to x. Every range includes the empty range. Uh, even the empty range includes the empty range. If the empty range includes something, then it must be the empty range too. Uh, with overlaps, um, usually x overlaps y is the same as saying that they have a non-empty intersection. Uh, this isn't quite right if either of them is already empty, but it's close. And also everything overlaps the empty range. So anyway, this is all a lot, just a lot to say that you don't lose anything by using multi-ranges instead of ranges. In all of these formulas, you could put a range or a multi-range for x and y if you just change the empty symbol. Uh, so Postgres has this polymorphic type system that lets you write generic functions. There's already an any range type, and I added an any multi-range type. In addition, uh, I ha added an any compatible multi-range type, which is a new type of polymorphic uh, type that's out there now. <coughs> Here are a few of the polymorphic types along with examples of a concrete type. So if you had a function that uh, could take an any element and you give it an integer, then uh, the other polymorphic parameters and return value have to all agree with that. And uh, in the case of the return value, Postgres will infer what it is supposed to be for you. Uh, if any of these are known, then the polymorphic type system can infer the others, except that uh, Postgres lets you define multiple range types on the same base type. So you cannot infer in any range, or now in any multi-range, given just in any element or any array. But you can go the other way. Uh, and in addition, uh, ranges and multi-ranges are one-to-one, -one, so you can make inferences back and forth there. Multi-ranges also come with a few non-operator functions. Uh, lower and upper return what you'd expect, the, the, the least value in the multi-range or the greatest value in the multi-range. Uh, there's a multi-range constructor that takes a single range. There are also variadic type-specific constructors like for multi-range, uh, TS multi-range. But it's handy to have one that works for any type. In fact, this was important for me when I was writing the test suite. Range merge sort of the opposite of this constructor. Given a multi-range, it returns the range that uh, would include that entire multi-range without any gaps. And then there's a couple aggregate functions. Range ag takes a bunch of ranges and combines them, basically finding the union. And range intersect ag does the same thing, but uh, finding the intersection. One of the last things that I'm wrapping up with multi-ranges right now is selectivity. <coughs> uh, you know, when you use operators in a where condition or in joins, the Postgres planner has to decide how to fit that into the broader query. The biggest question is how many rows you're going to get back. If your condition returns practically the whole table, then it's faster to ignore the indexes and do a full table scan. Uh, we can also make better decisions about how we nest our loops, you know, when to build up which in memory st data structures, that kind of thing. So Postgres keeps statistics on the distribution of values in every column, and then it calls selectivity functions to estimate what portion of the table a condition will return. So you have these selectivity functions that can solve the statistics and return a number from 0 to 1. So there's two parts of the job here. <coughs> First, you have to collect the statistics, you know, which happens when you analyze the table, and then you have to compute the selectivities. So collecting the statistics is done for multi-ranges. Computing the selectivities is uh, almost done. 
I've added this multi-range style function, which you can see referenced by this particular overlaps operator. Uh, it works quite a bit like ranges. Uh, the analysis is building up histograms of the upper and lower bounds and also the length of the ranges. And so then the selectivity function can use that to make a guess about how many rows in the table are going to overlap or you know, whatever uh, be contained by uh, a given constant value. This is really easy for most of the operators, but for overlaps and contains, it's a little bit tricky. <coughs> uh, right now, it's very similar to what range cell does. Uh, this will be biased towards denser multi-ranges, ones without gaps, right? Uh, so it's probably a good idea to add a density histogram that we can combine with length, uh, or maybe even instead of storing the length in the length histogram, store in the length times the density, uh, just to get a slightly better estimate. Okay, that's all I have to say about multi-ranges. So let's talk about uh, temporal features. The first uh, temporal feature is to define a primary key. Here's the syntax for how you would do that. ID is an ordinary column, like an integer or something. I'll call this the scalar part of the key, maybe betraying some Perl influence. It can be whatever type you want. You could have multiple columns. Uh, and then at the end, you have a range column, in this case, valid at. Uh, I would like to also support uh, periods and not just range columns. Periods are these weird SQL 2011 things that are like ranges, but not as good. <laughs> you can see my last talk for more details about that. Uh, but I think it's important to go ahead and support both for you know, compatibility's sake. Personally, in my own project, I'll just use ranges. Uh, of course, you can also, there's also syntax for creating this constraint inside of your create table statement. So temporal primary keys are a little weird because you could have the same ID twice, uh, as long as their valid times don't overlap. So imagine this is a table of houses. You have two records for house one, maybe because it was reappraised and 2018 had a different value from 2019. And house two hasn't been changed during that whole time period, so there's only one record there. <coughs> Normally primary keys have they are a unique constraint with an appropriate index for that. Temporal primary keys are really exclusion constraints, and so they need a different kind of index. Here is some uh, a little snippet of the code that builds up a different kind of index for temporal primary keys. There's already code to include all of the scalar parts of the key in the index, along with their equals operators. So we just add code to include the without overlaps term, and we use the overlaps operator instead of the equals operator. Also, this has to be a gist index because Btree won't be able to do overlaps. Here's the syntax for a temporal foreign key. It looks kind of similar. Uh, first, you have the scalar part of the key. Again, there can be more than one column. Then you give the range. You need to give a range from the referencing table and from the reference table. Note that you use without overlaps for a primary key and period for a foreign key. Also, without overlaps comes after the column name, but period comes before the column name. Uh, I apologize for this inconsistency, but it's what SQL 2011 says it's supposed to look like. Uh, and again, you can also put this into your create table statement. Here I'm showing two tables, a houses table and a rooms table. Naturally, rooms are child records of houses. You can't have a room if you don't have a house, right? So the houses table has a couple of green records. They are both for house one. The rooms table has a yellow record and a red record. So this is room one and room two. Suppose they both reference house one. The foreign key value has to be present in the reference table for the whole time that the child record exists. So the red row here is invalid the room can't exist before the house does. Now, it might take more than one row in the primary key table to cover the whole foreign key range. The 
yellow row requires both house records to satisfy it. So how do you implement that? You need to roll up all rows with the same scalar key part and combine their ranges into one big range. Maybe the resulting range even has gaps. Uh, so this sounds like a job for multi-ranges. Uh, and the way we roll up values from multiple rows is with aggregate functions. So what we need here is exactly range ag, which we defined in the, the, the multi-ranges. Ordinary foreign keys are uh, actually triggers, uh, but they're special in two ways. First, they're constraint triggers. A constraint trigger is pretty much like an ordinary trigger, except that you know, it can cancel a query like an ordinary trigger, but uh, like constraints, it is deferrable. Second, foreign keys are quote unquote internal triggers, which means you don't see them when you describe a table or you use those kinds of commands. They're after row triggers, like any constraint trigger has to be. <coughs> there are two triggers on the referencing table and two triggers on the reference table. Suppose we call these the parent and child tables just because I, that I think is easier to visualize. If you delete or you update the parent, then we have to make sure you didn't create any orphans in the child table. And if you insert or update a child, you have to make sure that its parent is really there. So I'm showing SQL equivalent to what Postgres does to create the insert trigger on the child table. There's three more of these uh, statements, uh, one for each trigger. If you look in the PG trigger table, you can actually see these triggers. And there's a function you can call PG get trigger def, uh, which you pass its OID, and then you'll see this exact SQL. Here is the SQL that trigger runs. So we run this when the child table changes, the rooms table. Uh, $1 is the foreign key value. If you had multiple columns, you'd see $2, $3, etc. We're just making sure that the primary key really exists on the parent table. This is the interesting side of the relationship. Checking the child table when the primary key changes is even easier. Here's the same thing, but for a temporal foreign key. Uh, they just have slightly different trigger functions. Instead of RI, which is referential integrity, I'm using TRI for temporal referential integrity. Like before, the triggers just run some, t some SQL to make sure the referential integrity still holds. Here's that SQL. It's almost the same as the SQL before. $1 is the new foreign key value. Uh, we want to make sure the parent table, uh, the parent table's primary key has that value too. Uh, Obviously, the table and column names are not hard coded. More than one scalar column is still supported. Uh, if it's not a partition table, we say from only like other foreign key checks. Uh, after all the scalar keys, you have a dollar in plus one. So here it's dollar uh, two, and that's the range value. So to walk through this, uh, we pull out all the valid at ranges for that ID. It's a, an optimization to only look at rows that overlap $2, because outside of that, those are irrelevant anyway. Then we merge them all together with range ag, and we make sure they completely cover the foreign key range. This is a little trickier than it needs to be because of locking. For key share, uh, is a light lock that we is really only used for foreign key checks, uh, but it doesn't support aggregate queries, so we have to aggregate outside of the subquery. As far as I know, there's no problem with this, but if anyone knows different, let me know. Uh, this query is for the foreign key, uh, was when the foreign key side changes. And again, if the primary key side changes, it's even simpler. We don't need brain jag. Uh, it still just looks for foreign keys, foreign key rows that still match the old primary key value that's going away. <coughs> and if it finds any of the constraint fails. In fact, there were no changes at all on that side because it uses the, uh, the operators from the index to do the comparison, and it already knows that it should be using an equals operator for the scalar part and an overlaps operator for the range part. So let's go back to our SQL statement. What about cascade if you have a, a temporal foreign key? What does that even mean? Well, it means that we need to delete or update the affected region of the referencing table, and we want to only hit that portion that is applicable, right? So cascade is actually easy to implement if we have temporal update and delete. 
because that's exactly what a temporal cascade does. So let's go on to temporal update and delete. Here's the syntax for an update. We have this for portion of clause that names a range column or a period, and then it gives the bounds that you want to target. For example, suppose you have a house and you want to update the property tax appraisal for the year 2020. <coughs> we want to update just that one year. So here we see a before and after. The green boxes are the same record pre and post update. The yellow boxes are newly inserted records. Because you're changing just that one portion, you're, you need your database to add new records for the unchanged portions with all the old values. So they have all of the same values before the update, except their boundaries are changed. So doing a temporal update can actually cause inserts to happen in addition to the update. And by the way, if you have insert triggers on your table, those secondary inserts fire your insert triggers. Delete is pretty much is very similar, the same syntax. Suppose we, we had a house that was built in 1950, and then we discover it wasn't actually built until 1960, so we need to delete those first 10 years from the database. According to the SQL standard, you're supposed to really delete the record, but then insert new records if there's anything left over. And so in this case, the yellow box is a newly inserted record. If there were any leftovers before the deleted section, then we do an insert for those two. <coughs> So like update, deleting a row can actually insert rows. And the implementation, update and delete, are practically the same. So I'll just treat them from now on as the same from now on. Unlike temporal integrity constraints, doing the DML has to go through the whole query pipeline. Uh, primary important keys are utility commands, so they can skip the planner and the optimizer. Uh, but our update and delete has to go through everything. So first is the parse stage. We just pull out strings into the appropriate structs, and we don't really try to do anything yet. The analyze phase is kind of part of the parsing phase. We make sure, uh, we, we start to interpret those strings. We make sure that the columns really exist. Uh, we turn things into node trees uh, for expressions, column references, function calls, operators, that kind of thing. Next we have the rewrite phase, where we transform the query if there are views or rewrite rules the planning phase where we generate lots of possible plans. Each plan is another node tree. In the optimize phase, we choose the plan that seems best. If you say explain, then you can see the plan's node tree, basically. And in the execute phase, uh, we have nodes that actually do everything. In my case, everything else was really easy, uh, practically just copying things from one struct into another. But here in the execute phase, things got really hard. I had to learn about tuple table slots. Uh, I was a little concerned about locking and transaction isolation. Uh, I really owe my progress here to my wife, who let me go off to a cabin for a week weekend and work on it while she took care of our five kids. Uh, everything else I've been able to do just in the evenings, but this one really took some focus. I've noticed on the mailing list that a lot of guest submissions get rejected because they do all the work in the wrong part of this process. For example, everything in the analysis phase. Uh, and I recall somebody writing a, a post there a year or two ago explaining why you couldn't do that. I, I wish I had it bookmarked. Um, it would uh, probably help me to know which phase to put things in. Um, so hopefully I've done the right, done a good job there, but if there's any feedback, I'm glad to hear that. So here's the, the struct that we fill in in the bison file. We just need to know the range name, uh, and the, the start and end of the targeted time frame. Here's where we do that in gram.y. <coughs> uh, right now it's just the name of the range column, but in the future it could be a period also. Uh, in the analysis step, we would figure out you know, which what you're really talking about. Range name location is just an ordinary bison thing for error reporting. And start and end are the endpoints to build another range. Note that these take expressions. At first I only accepted literal strings because there was a shift-reduce conflict making things tricky, but obviously they can't just be strings. You need to use the now function or arithmetic, uh, data arithmetic. Uh, it does have to be a constant, uh, constant values though. The spec disallows 
column references or non-deterministic functions. So here's that shift reduce conflict that I mentioned before. An interval can use this two syntax uh, where uh, it gives a value with less granularity than the value before. So you can say day to hour or month to day. Uh, and you can use this to express a time zone offset. I've never done this before. I'm not even sure exactly what this means or what the purpose is. But apparently it's part of the SQL standard. Um, we don't mention it in our documentation, but we have tests for it. Uh, so after Bison reads the day in day to hour, should it keep parsing the interval, which is the, the shift alternative, or should it end this end it and go on to the from part of the proportion of, which would be reducing, and doesn't know what to do. Here's the Bison's debugging output about the problem. The dot is Bison's current position, so it's just read the day token. Two is the look ahead token, and it says, should it shift, which is to keep going in the current rule, or should it reduce, so finish the current rule at intervals and go to something else. It, as a human, if you use this interval feature, there's not really an ambiguity because you would have two twice. Uh, we can see that, but Bison can't because it only has one look ahead token. Uh, if you have two once, there's also no ambiguity because it has to belong to the proportion of. But I don't know how to teach Bison that. I, I'm pretty sure it's not possible, but if anyone has an idea, let me know. This is basically the same as the classic shift-reduce problem of where does the else go? Do you attach it to the first if or to the second if? <coughs> Historically, we've always attached it to the nearest if, and this is what I'm doing as well. The two belongs to the interval, so I gave two a higher precedence than the day, hour, etc. tokens. I think attaching the two to the proportion of would be nicer actually, since the interval feature is so obscure, but I couldn't do that without breaking intervals everywhere. Anyway, I doubt it will be a common issue in practice, because who really writes time zones like this? You know, they'll, uh, you really should be giving the day of the time zone so that it works in daylight savings time. Uh, and you can always add parentheses if you need to. I'll probably keep stubbornly trying to fix it, but um, I it probably needs. I don't. I don't really expect to be able to, unless uh, someone has a suggestion. So let's move to the analyze phase. Here we are basically taking these strings, interpreting them, and filling in another struct with more information. We're doing things like looking up the OIDs of tables, columns, that kind of thing, uh, finding the types of things. Lots of error checking happens here. We make sure that valid at is really a column. We make sure that the column is a range column. We make sure that the table has a temporal primary key. We make sure that the range column is part of that primary key, etc. <coughs> and we build up some, expre some helpful expression nodes. So the analysis phase has to take the parse result and make these real node trees. Here we have a function call node. What we're doing is we're calling the range constructor with the endpoints that the user gave in the proportion of clause. We also build a node to call the overlaps operator on that range and the, uh, the range column, which is a, a var node and is stored in the results range field, not which is in here. Here's another snippet from the analyze phase. We use proportion of to add an implicit condition to the where clause. We only want to hit records that overlap the range that you're targeting. This is probably close to the offense I described above, where maybe it's the wrong place. Uh, if you use explain, then you'll see this extra condition that you didn't type. Uh, in my opinion, that's probably desirable, actually. So. I think maybe this is the right place for this, but if people have another suggestion, let me know. We also build a node for the intersects operator, which we will use to update uh, the range column. FC is the range constructor call from above, and the target list is all the things that we'll update, because we have to update those uh, the endpoints in the table. 
So how do you want to deal with update from now until further notice? This is really important because you'll actually use this more often than not, right? Usually you want to update from now into the future or from some time into the future. The SQL standard doesn't explicitly say how to do this. Uh, since periods officially aren't supposed to have null uh, values, you're sort of forced to use a set and null like January 1st, 3000. That's so ugly though. Um, uh, it's nice that our ranges let you use null instead. Uh, infinity would make an okay sentinel. It's a valid value for timestamps, dates, floats, not integers. And it, it'd be nice to support all types, although officially we don't have to. Uh, with ranges, you can express unbounded with null, and Oracle actually does this with its own periods, by the way. Uh, periods are, are allowed to have null endpoints, and they work just like our ranges do. I imagine that our periods would be the same to keep them closer to our ranges, and since there's already precedent for doing it this way. But what do you write in the proportion of? Do you write null? It seems a little bit awkward. Uh, it's sort of like exposing the implementation of ranges, uh, I think. Writing infinity might feel a little bit more natural, uh, but I still like null the best. It fits better with ranges. It works for all types. Uh, um, but still, I fear, fear some people won't think of it. Here's another issue. We're subtracting the range from now out to null. Uh, from, th from that, we're subtracting the range from now. We're subtracting the range from now out, out to infinity, from the range from now out to null. So what do you suppose the result will be? We're taking a range uh, that goes out to infinity with null, and we're subtracting everything out to infinity. Uh, so will this be the empty range? No. Actually, we're left with this tiny slice, the range from infinity and beyond. Uh, so, plus and using plus and minus infinity causes problems here because there's this tiny slice left over. As your database ages, you'd wind up with records with just this little sliver of nonsense time. I used to have some code that would detect literal infinity and replace it with null. Uh, I took it out. That kind of helpfulness seems contrary to Postgres's usual approach. But accepting infinity is surely a, a foot gun. It's the same foot gun that already exists with ranges, so it's not adding anything new. I'm inclined to just leave it, but add a warning in the documentation. Uh, but it might be a bigger deal than it feels to me. Uh, I gave a trial, a trial run of this talk at my local Postgres meetup last month, and someone said they had actually messed up their data with this uh, time, this infinity versus null problem just using ranges. It made a big mess of their data and they weren't sure what was going on until they realized that those weren't the same thing. And there were only like six or eight people at this talk. So maybe we do have to do something. Uh, maybe we should uh, detect literal infinity and print a warning. I'm not sure what, what the right answer is there. Uh, for the rewrite phase, I didn't have to do anything. For the planning phase, I didn't have to do anything. For the optimizing phase, I didn't have to do anything. For the execute phase, I do have to do one extra thing. I have to make those ex extra inserts actually happen. So first we need to evaluate the target range given in the proportion of clause. Remember that we built a node for this, uh, calling the range constructor function. Now we have to actually evaluate that function. We uh, use a cache for this, so we don't have to do it every row because remember it's supposed to be a constant value. Next we need to get the valid at of the, the current tuple. Uh, some error checking was omitted here. Uh, honestly, I barely understand tuple table slots, but I think it's kind of like this. A tuple table is a collection of tuples, and a slot holds one of those tuples. The slot isn't the tuple itself. It has metadata about the tuple, like whether it's part of a table or just some expression, etc. Uh, there's functions to store a tuple into a slot and get it out again. So we initialize a tuple table slot 
inside of the exec init modify table function, which run, runs once for the whole statement. And then we use the slot later once for every row. Uh, if someone knows of a good document I can read about tuple table function, tuple table slots, uh, I would love to know about that. Uh, so the first line here stores the tuple into the slot based on the tuple ID. I suspect using snapshot in is wrong. Um, I guess it needs to be something that is visible to this update. Uh, I was surprised the tuple we're currently updating wasn't already loaded and available somewhere, but I couldn't find that anywhere. So I'm, I'm grabbing it out here. Next we pull out the datum, which is what old range is, uh, and then we convert it to a range type. Here's a, a function that does what we need for lopping off those leftover uh, parts of the, the range. We find out if the current tuples range extends past the proportion of range, either on the left or on the right. And we store the leftovers in these leftover range type one and two variables. Suppose that we have some leftovers before the target range. Here's code that will actually do the insert for that. We extract the current tuple from its slot. We copy it over into leftover tuple 1 as a minimal tuple, which means that we can manipulate its datums in memory and then save those. Uh, so we set the datum for the valid at column. And then we insert the tuple into the table. And then there's identical code for handling leftovers above the target range. To be honest, I wasn't totally happy with all this. Uh, it felt too specific for being in the modify table node, um, like I was mixing widely different levels of abstraction. Uh, there's nothing else in this file that references specific types, like I'm referencing range types. I had to add several include statements to the top to give myself access to the functions I needed. Um, it was fun to learn about executor nodes, but I suspect it may be the wrong approach. It would be nice if we could implement temporal update and delete as triggers. I think that if we could, I could rip out all those executor changes almost. <coughs> uh, we already use hidden triggers for foreign keys, so there should be an injection there. Like the foreign key triggers, this would be an after row trigger. I just need some way to tell the trigger what was in the for portion of clause. Since this is new syntax, obviously there's no existing infrastructure to tell triggers what's there. Uh, I need to know whether that clause, what was in that clause, and also whether it was even present, right? Is this a temporal update delete, or is this just an ordinary update and delete? Here's the struct that gets passed to every trigger function. In C, you get this trigger directly. In PLPG SQL, these are available. The fields here are available as variables, starting with TG underscore. So what if we added the proportion of target to this struct? <coughs> Maybe it should be a datum instead. That, that feels more correct to me. And then you would need to add a, a null flag also next to it. Uh, my current patch has the executor node approach but I plan to try out this trigger approach instead. So let me know what you think. Okay, well thank you for your attention. These slides are available on GitHub, and if you have any feedback or questions, I would be glad to hear it. Thank you. Paul is here to answer the questions that came up during his talk. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of questions, but there was quite a lot of helpful feedback, uh, especially by Vic and Peter in the IRC channel. So I will um, also try to summarize that a little bit. But I'll go through some of these questions here. Uh, first, there was a question by David Feder. I think maybe this is from a different talk or for people more expert than me. Uh, but he asked, do we have a lot of room to, to run with making who he deform tuple more efficient? Um, and I am not the right person to answer that question. <laughs> Maybe this has to do with the, the issue of on-disk versus in-memory format. 
um, but I have I haven't ever looked at that, so I will have to have to find out. Uh, sorry that I can't give a better answer to that. Uh, Vic asked about foreign keys. Wouldn't an exists query be more efficient than doing a full aggregate? And the issue there is that uh, the referenced table, the parent table, uh, it might have two or three or however many rows that you have to put together to make, uh, in order to fulfill the reference, to make the reference valid. So it's not as simple as just an exists query. Uh, Snodgrass's book actually uh, gives an implementation of foreign key checks um, you know, that don't use aggregate functions or anything like that. But it's, um, it's like a page and a half of SQL. Uh, it's like a not exists inside of an exists inside of a not exists, something like that. And so um, I doubt that it would be uh, competitive to do something like that. But as far as I know, it's not anywhere close to as simple as just an exist query. But um, if you if you have one that works, let me know because that would be good to know. Um, Nick also asked, what should we do about returning and proportion? So uh, like if you have an, an update or uh, an insert, you can have a returning at the bottom. I think even for delete, I'm not sure. Uh, and it will uh, it'll give you back the values. So I think that we don't need to change anything about returning. Uh, I think that the only question is really the, the endpoints. Uh, and I think that we should return the endpoints uh, that we set the row to. So um, not exactly the endpoints that you're targeting, because if you're targeting something, your update could hit multiple records, right? But that are smaller than the target. Uh, but we would just return what, uh, what we set those column values to. Um, I think that is the, the sensible thing to do. And then um, the, the secondary inserts that handle leftovers wouldn't be returned or anything like that. I think the idea is that those uh, are supposed to be almost invisible, right? Like that's just to preserve the data that you didn't touch. Another question was uh, how to handle um, intervals. Um, and I think this this has to do with the bison parser and the ship reduce conflict. And uh, we talked about that a little bit on IRC. Uh, it sounds like uh, Vic has a working solution that I'm going to take a look at, uh, which would be great. A nice improvement there. Um, okay, I took some other notes. Uh, there was a, um, some discussion on IRC about the infinity versus null issue and what uh, what kind of syntax we want. And I think there were three different suggestions. One was to use unbounded, which is a reserved keyword. Uh, another is max underscore value or um, max value without an underscore. I think I'll look at all of those. Uh, I guess partitions uh, use max value and min value, and it seems worthwhile uh, um, using the same language as partitions if we can. Uh, uh, that just seems nice to our users. Uh, so that that's probably what I will um, go with if everything else is equal. Uh, and also there's this question that if we, if somebody gives a max value, then we could convert it to null in the parser, which seems nice to me. It kind of solves the foot gun problem. Um, I was concerned that that was um, too quote unquote helpful for Postgres, but maybe it's, it is the right thing to do. Um, I wanted to add this, I recorded this talk a week and a half ago, and I actually have implemented the trigger version of uh, for portion of, uh, it needs a little bit um, more testing and documentation, but uh, there should be a new patch on the mailing list soon for that. Um, another thing that still remains to be done is uh, create constraint with index. Uh, so that I think is a, an easy one. Uh, uh, 
I've noticed some conversation on the mailing list about not using SPI in our foreign key triggers. Uh, so obviously that uh, kind of overlaps with the work that I'm doing. Uh, if we wind up building the query uh, tree directly, then I'll have to update the code to um, do that for foreign key triggers also. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's it. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's uh, suggestions and questions and uh, how, how also just how welcome people of any feel being part of the Postgres community. So thanks for, for watching. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Goodbye. Bye.